So you guys sounded amazing. Last night, if you miss it, missed our Welcome to Summer um, bash we did here, it was, it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. It was an indoor event, so it was a rain or shine. Um, I apologize. I was singing like crazy, and I lost a bit of my voice this morning. So i um, just going to get through this the best we can. Um, last night was incredible. One of the things that was amazing to me is up here on the front row, our two front rows were filled with all the kids that were here. And they were up here singing and worshiping like I've never seen before. It was unbelievable. Um, I, I took a picture of it. And I took a video of it. When a camera comes out and kids see it, they start to stare at the camera. So I didn't get to capture just everything, but it was amazing. And church, I'm going to tell you, if you, we actually bring the kids in the back um, every worship service so they can actually come in and experience being a part of this. And if you want to see them actually put kind of, I mean, say this nice, they kind of put us to shame. Turn around and watch them worship because they actually are getting after it. It's unbelievable. And so, I, it, 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 man, it made a big impact on me last night. And these kids, they are the future of our church. They are the future of our country. They're the future of our cities. And we, I'm so thankful to see so many of them here just worshiping Jesus with us. Aren't you guys? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> So I don't know if we're going to have the picture up at some point today. I want to show it to you, but it's, uh, yeah? Okay. All right. Let's move on. So last week we started a brand new series called um, Practicing the Way of Jesus in India. And, and let me tell you where this came from, okay? There seems to be a huge disconnect between believing in Jesus and following Jesus. It's a really big gap that fills in between there. What goes in the middle of those is something that we are calling spiritual formation because this is something that Dallas Willard identified that was the missing piece in between those. If you would do a survey, even across America today, a lot of people would say that they believe in Jesus, but when you go and you see what Jesus said to do as a follower, and then you take that belief and you lay it over the following part, that's where you're going to see a really big disconnect. So for us, we have started to try to identify what it looks like differently than what we're doing to actually move from people just believing Jesus to actually following him. Well, the easiest way to do that is to go back and see how Jesus actually lived his life. So there's three things that we're going to be hammering on for here until Jesus comes back. Here they are. We want you to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. These three things are what we feel like can shape a spiritually formed life with us. And so we're going to do a high flyover of what Be With Jesus means today because we're going to go much more in depth with these in the fall. And actually, we're going to we're kind of teach a vision series on what this means. But um, I'm going to do a little bit longer intro today because I think it's really important that you understand why we are doing this, okay? Now, some of you, this is your first exposure to church, so this is not going to make a whole lot of sense to you. But some of you, you've been in church a lot of your life, or you have other churches to compare this to, okay? Um, I, I want to you just to hang with me because what I'm going to say about churches, I'm going to paint with a broad brush, this does not mean that every church that I'm talking about, which I'm not mentioning any by name, it's not 100% true about churches. It's just church in general in America, okay? So I want you to hear that. Um, but last week, I introduced the idea of consumer Christianity. This was actually birthed out of a cultural response to what was happening in the 60s and 70s. The culture shifted so rapidly with the sexual revolution, the Vietnam War, the introduction of the hippie era of peace and free love, the influx of hard drugs, racial tensions, and a tanking economy. It sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Besides the hippie part. Outside of that, it sounds like I'm describing our society today, doesn't it? Well, coming out of a quarantine, the church has had to shift again and go, okay, what we were doing hasn't worked. What did you guys see coming out of quarantine when, when the so-called rubber met the road of people being followers of Jesus or not? We saw not only this great recession in the workforce, but we saw it in the church as well. I have personally witnessed more people who I thought were very solid, committed followers of Jesus walk away from the church completely. Heartbreaking, gut-wrenching to watch this happen, but there's a reason. It's because I think the way that we have done church, the way that we have built church, has been built on a really shaky foundation to where when the, sh the shaking of the foundation happened, the whole thing crumbled out from underneath us. 
Obviously, we're still here. The church is still going strong in America. So it seems a bit odd for me to say that, doesn't it? But the basis in which Jesus launched his church, if we could fast forward and he could look 2,000 years in the future, I'm pretty convinced it would not look like this. And when I say this, I mean the church in America. Now, let's work through a few things and just hang with me for a second. But like I said, I'm painting with a broad brush here, okay? For the past 60 years, the church in America has operated, I think, in a pretty unhealthy manner. We have more mega churches than ever before, which have created celebrity pastors. And those are two words that should never exist in the same sentence together. It's created a culture where people can hide, check off a box, not be involved in discipleship or community. But I want you to please hear me. There isn't anything wrong with megachurches. I am so grateful for the work that they've done in our country. But I am confident this is not how Jesus would do church if he were here. Let me tell you why I say that. In the early part of the book of Acts, which was the birth of the church, there were thousands of people a day getting saved. That's a mega church immediately in a day. 3,000 people here, 5,000 people here, another couple thousand over here. Those are immediate instant mega churches. And then if you keep reading, you get to the chapter 8 in the book of Acts. And what happened there is this dictator named Nero came out and he started to persecute Christians and it scattered all of those large groups into homes. That is where we read that the gospel took traction and went global over the next few hundred years was because people actually had to decide what they were going to believe, what they were going to do, and it was no longer going to be assembling in these large groups. Now, mega churches have popped up over the years throughout the course of history, and there are several around the globe today. But did you guys know that the average church around the world is about 20 people? The average church in America is about 80 people. Like we have this idea of what church should be and we look at it and we measure them by the really big ones around and there's not anything wrong with them, but that's our idea of church. Well, here's what happened when everybody got shoved into quarantine and we didn't know how this was all going to go. I think Jesus was shaking the trees to see who was going to hang on they, because they were grafted into that vine and the, they were the branches grafted in and he was going to see who was going to shake out and who was going to stay committed to this. What emerged on the other side, which is who we are today, I'm so grateful for. I could not be more excited about this church because I think what has happened is the people on this side of quarantine, the people on this side of having their world flipped upside down, if they still want anything to do with Jesus, to me, it says they're pretty serious about this. And this is how I feel about you guys. This is why I'm so grateful you're moving ahead on this journey with us. The people that are full of in churches right now in our city, I'm excited that they're there because it tells me that they're serious about something. Because it is not at all culturally cool, relevant, or acceptable to follow Jesus today at all. And so I just want to say thank you for being committed to Jesus, for going on this journey to practice the way of Jesus in our city, specifically in church. I'm going to tell you something. What Jesus is going to do with that is going to be incredible. And it's like something that we've never seen before. You excited about that? Yeah, yeah good, me too. The church in America has seemed to be a force to be reckoned with over the past 60 years. We've seen incredible things because of it. But things have been exposed over the last few years that have shown a really unhealthy impact of the church in America. Do you remember when in the, that famous scene in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Cowardly Lion and the Scarecrow were all standing in front of the Great Wizard? I actually went back and rewatched the scene this morning so I could get this right. Every time that he spoke, they went like this. Literally every time, go back and watch, except for Dorothy. She's the G of this group. <laughs> All of the, the men around her were like, Ugh. And every time he spoke, this fire would shoot up and the smoke would come out. And he was, had this massive face on the screen. He was really scary. Until this little dog goes over and pulls this curtain back and reveals this guy standing back there doing controls. And then the famous line says, don't mind that man behind the curtain. <laughs> and then as he's exposed and he comes out, Dorothy says, you're a bad man. He's like, I'm not a bad man. I'm actually a good man. I'm just a bad wizard. <laughs> but I think like when the curtain was pulled back on the church, 
Like the church is good. The church is not bad. I'm still convinced Jesus is the hope of the world and he's going to accomplish it through his church. Amen? The church isn't bad. The church is good. It's just time that we, we actually build a foundation that will last whatever comes in the future centuries for our churches. I want to walk intentionally on this journey together, church. The three things, again, that we're going to be walking through are to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. I want to throw a slide up here. I want you to see this. I want to show you, again, a little bit deeper what spiritual formation is going to mean. It it is Christ changing us toward a total interchange of our ideas and images for his. Think about what I said spiritual formation was. We're moving from believing to following. And specifically today, if we want to be with Jesus, I want you to imagine Jesus were physically here with you. How differently would your ideas, your images, and your words be if you were literally physically looking Jesus in the face? My guess is pretty different. My guess is what you allowed on your phone would be a little different. What you binged watched at night would probably be a little different. Your ideas and the thoughts would be a little bit different. And so in spiritual formation, although he's not physically here with us, he still tells us to be with him. I want you to sink that thought into your mind. Because let me read this again. Spiritual formation in Christ moves us towards a total interchange of our ideas and images for him. Now, this is what Dallas Willard said about spiritual formation. I want you to think about that. Whenever you came to faith in Christ... Think about all of the images and the thoughts that you had built for yourself up to that point. And then he says spiritual formation is about actually shifting those around to Jesus' thoughts and his images. This is why statistically, after a person turns 18 years old, their likeliness of following Jesus drops drastically. Because we hit that point where we're like, I've actually got it figured out now. I don't need Jesus. And so for those of you that came to faith as adults, man, that's amazing, but it's probably going to be really difficult for you because you have a life of images and thoughts built. And Jesus says, I want to spiritually form you, which means I want to shift those around the other way. Now, not all of them, obviously. It's not like we're filled with evil and bad and all of that. But it's the ones that don't match up to who he would be is what we have to shift. So we introduced the question to you. We're going to throw that up on the screen. The question is not, are you being formed, but what are you being formed into? Now, I want you to think that through that. Fast forward 10 years, 20 years, 40 years into the future, doing exactly what you're doing now, what would you be developing on the other end? What would you be forming into right now? That's the question that I want you to answer. Think about how, like when Pastor Joel was talking about anxiety this morning, think about how you handle anxiety this morning. Think about how you handle stress and worry and money and all of those things. And then fast forward 10 to 40 years and you're living exactly how you are now. What comes out down there? That's the question that we want you to answer. Now, think about it in the realm of spiritual formation. What if my thoughts and my images and my words and my actions shaped around Jesus, that's what I started doing right now, then look 10 to 40 years down the road and go, now what's going to be produced differently? Because it's not just for us, church, it's for the people around us. Jesus gave us a very specific mission before he ascended into heaven. And he said, this isn't for you to keep to you. This is way too big for that. The Savior of the world offers salvation through his sacrifice on the cross, not yours. What it's going to cost you is a life of surrender to him. Now go tell everybody that story. So what I want you to do is I want you to put this in the idea of the last command Jesus told us, which was to go and tell. And then I want you to stop and I want you to measure however you're living now, is that going to be the outcome in 10 to 40 years, okay? So today is being about being with Jesus. When Jesus is calling his disciples to follow him, he would answer questions a lot of times with, come and see. 
I told you how the rabbi um, apprenticeship went back then. You literally followed them around all day, every day, and literally did what they did at the time that they did it, in the manner in which they did it. You were literally becoming who they were. Jesus is inviting us with an open invitation to apprentice behind him today in 2022 for the rest of your life. It is an apprenticeship that if we are not with him, we don't know how to be like him, right? And so as we're starting to think through this, the first thing I have to do is like, okay, how often am I with Jesus? It's the question that we need to answer. I want to go to some scripture and I want to show you how this is because the disciples, I feel like, now Jesus didn't say this, I feel like they had a distinct advantage. They actually got to walk around with him. They got to see how he interacted with the woman at the well. They got to see how when the woman caught in adultery was brought before him, how he interacted with that. They got to literally watch him as anger and rage built up inside of them. He saw, they saw him squash every situation and they learned from the master. So if Jesus is telling us to be with him, what in the world does that mean? Let's go to John. We're going to start in 16, chapter 16. We're going to read a few verses here and then we're going to give you something practical of how we can see this come to light. So Jesus, starting out in verse 5, here's what he says. But now I'm going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asked me, where are you going? Yet because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So their rabbi, their master is leaving. And they are very distraught about this. They don't really ask where he's going. They're just really filled with sorrow. He says, nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. This was that, hey, it's not you, it's me moment (laughs) with Jesus. He's like, I could stay here with you, but it's much easier and it's much better, in fact, for you if I go. He said, because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin righteousness, and judgment. Look down at verse 12. He said, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. Now, I want you to imagine the disciples are sitting here. They don't know who the Holy Spirit is. They don't understand who this helper is, but they trust Jesus and they know, okay, you're leaving, but you're sending somebody with us to be for us, to be with us. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't get introduced until much later after Jesus actually leaves in an incredible way at the day of Pentecost. What I want you to understand is like, I... I, I'm asking you to trust Jesus the same way that these disciples trusted Jesus. They could have stayed in their sorrow. They could have stayed upset. They could have been frustrated with Jesus. How could you leave us? We've been with you. We've dedicated our whole lives to you. How could you do this to us? And instead they said, okay, I don't really know what that means, but I'll trust you and I'll follow this Holy Spirit. See, church, that is our link of being with Jesus. Now, for some of you, you might have grown up in churches where you don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. It's like that weird uncle that everybody has that comes to gatherings. (laughs) That's a lot of times how we look at the Holy Spirit. We tend to view him in one of two ways. Well, I've been by that crazy church where they run around and go up and down the aisles with red flags and fall over. Is that the Holy Spirit? And I'm being serious. I've heard people describe it like that. Or like, oh no, the Holy Spirit scares me. I I don't want that. I I want you to realize that in your salvation, in your day of surrender, the Holy Spirit is what comes and lives inside of you. We're all on the same page with that, right? Yeah, okay. The same (coughs) power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that's living inside of you, amen? The way that you're convicted to not do something or to do something is the Holy Spirit, agreed? Good. So do you think it's really important for us to understand who the Holy Spirit is? Ooh, few answers, fewer answers on that one. Let, let me ask that question again because we all need to get this. 
Do you think it's important to understand who the Holy Spirit is to you? Yes. Okay. So, Jesus is introducing the Holy Spirit to his disciples, saying that he will be with you when I leave. This is still true for us today. Look at this slide. The first and primary goal of apprenticeship to Jesus is learning to live in a constant state of awareness and of connection to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to leave that up for a minute. I want you to process that statement, and I want you to understand this is the first step in this process for you. The first and primary goal of apprenticeship. So let's say you're sitting here this morning. You're like, okay, I want to apprentice to Jesus. The first and primary goal to apprenticeship is learning to live in a constant state of awareness and of connection to the Holy Spirit. So I'm not only aware of him, but I'm actually connected to him. Have you guys ever felt something inside of you as a follower of Jesus that's telling you to do something and you do it or you don't? That is a connection with the Holy Spirit. That is something that is saying, hey, I'm guiding you, I'm leading you, trust me. The question is, how do we respond to that? Because a lot of times it's based out of fear of why we do it or don't do it, isn't it? So now for some of you right now, you're, you're wrestling through whatever it is that you know about the Holy Spirit. But I want to read this to you one more time. The first and primary goal of apprenticeship to Jesus is learning to live in a constant state of awareness of and connection to the Holy Spirit. It's almost like we live in two places at once. I wake up to start my day and I'm with the Holy Spirit. I'm driving in my car and I'm with the Holy Spirit. I'm sitting in class at school and I'm with the Holy Spirit. I'm sitting in a meeting at work and I'm with the Holy Spirit. I'm on a date with my wife and I'm aware of and I'm connected with the Holy Spirit. Everything I do in the gym, I'm aware of and connected to the Holy Spirit. We can't remove him from the everyday pieces and parts of our lives and just put him into this and then whenever we get around to reading this. If we're going to be apprenticing to Jesus, we have to be very aware of and connected to all the time, the Holy Spirit. He is the one Jesus sent to be with us. If we're going to be with Jesus, we have to be with the Holy Spirit. What I want you to understand, this becomes a regular part of your life, which means, man, some things are going to change for you. Because when you go to look at something, you go to go into a place, you go to do something, and the Holy Spirit's like, "Uh uh-uh. You then have to go, I don't want to be with you right now. Can we break up for a minute? (laughs) Or you have to go, all right, no, you're right. I shouldn't do that. See, this is going to be a learned lifestyle done by practicing and apprenticing. And I want you to hear me very carefully, church. I'm a type A personality, and I want to have this done by the end of the week. (laughs) This is a years-long journey for us. Some of you will accomplish this in a year where you're starting to get the idea of being with the Holy Spirit all the time. Some of you, it's going to be three years. Some of you, it's going to be five years. And we're going to kick you in the butt to get you sooner. (laughs) Seriously, we will though, because we love you. But let me just say something. As long as you are moving forward on a regular basis with understanding who the Holy Spirit is and being with Jesus in this, you're on the right path however long that takes. I want to make sure you hear me on that. Because I think a lot of times we get excited and we're like, all right, me and the Holy Spirit tomorrow, all day, every day. And you wake up and at 830, you're like, oh, shoot, the Holy Spirit, that's right. And then you get busy and you're at like lunch. Dang it, Holy Spirit, why didn't you say anything? I'm supposed to be with you. And then at nighttime, we lay down and we're like, oh, Holy Spirit. All right, be with me as I sleep. Let's start there. <laughs> because we, we get in these ideas that we're going to go and we're going to conquer all of it and we're going to make it all happen. And Jesus said, look, move towards me regularly. Make this a part of your life. This is apprenticeship for a reason. So, take the pressure off of yourself. 
Before we read this next section of scripture, let me ask you a question. And if you know me well enough by now, you know this is a trick question, but you ready? If you could get whatever you asked for, would you be interested in that? Now you're not going to answer me, are you? <laughs> All right, we got some takers. Let's go to John 14. Let me show you what Jesus says. Starting in verse 25, we're just going to read a few, then we're going to read John 15. Starting in verse 25, here's what he says. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. That should comfort you in this journey of apprenticeship. Did you guys catch that? He's going to be with you all the time. He's going to remind you of these things. He's actually going to teach you also. Look at the next verse. Peace I leave with you. That should be the second part of what brings comfort to you. The Holy Spirit is not some mysterious, weird thing. Our misunderstanding of who he is is what makes it like that for us. But this couldn't be more comforting than anything else Jesus could have ever said. Let me read it to you one more time. He said, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. He'll be with you always. So, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Man. You talk about a grand slam verse from Jesus. Like, do you guys realize that this might be invoking some fear in some of you right now and Jesus just squashed that? Because he said... Hey, whoa, 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 peace is what I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. I want you to write this verse down. I want you to memorize this verse. I want you to write it on a three by five card, put it on the screen of your phone, whatever it looks like for you. But you need a, an often reminder of this. This is Luke 14, or John 14. This is John 14. My peace I live with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. You want to answer to your anxiety, your stress, your worry? Come back here often. Anxiety and stress and worry is much more detailed than that, but this is a really good place for you to start in verse 27. Now look at verse 15. Here's how we do this. You ready? Chapter 15, sorry. Starting in verse 1, here's what it says. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Let me pause for a second. Here's the picture Jesus is painting for how we are to be with him. It's called abiding. It's an interesting word. We don't use it much today. But Jesus is going to go on to say, you abide in me and I will abide in you. But he's painting a picture of a tree, which in this agrarian culture that Jesus was living in, we all understand trees, right? If you can understand and look at an apple tree right now in your mind, if you've ever gone down to Apple Works and picked apples and paid way too much for their cider and all that good stuff, it's amazing, but you know what I'm saying. And you look at an apple tree, if there is this really lush tree and then there's this dead branch that sticks out from it, it sticks out like a sore thumb. It doesn't even look like it belongs there. So as their workers come by, they get, come up to the branch that's dead and they clip it off. It goes into a brush pile and then it's burned later. Now, there's something that happens inside of a tree's growth where it's actually growing really healthy, but the healthy growth needs to be trimmed up and pruned so it can produce more fruit. Now, let me make sure you understand what Jesus is saying with this. That first quote that I said by Dallas Willard of us shifting our attention and thoughts to Jesus's is the pruning process. It is the process of me becoming less like me and more like Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but pruning is done with things that cut, and it's a little bit painful. 
Jesus never promised this easy, simple, cushy road for us. I don't know where we've gotten that from. If you read scripture and you watch his journey, if you watch how it ended for the apostles, these are not cushy, easy, fluffy journeys. These are difficult, but absolutely worth it. I want you to imagine now that maybe you're producing fruit. You're grafted into the branch. And Jesus says, nice job. Now I want to grow you more. So I'm about to prune you. It's, it's going to hurt a little. That should be the story of your life until you look at Jesus in the face one day. Because I think somehow we have been convinced that because I have reached a milestone of a Christian, my pruning days are over. Well, they can be if you don't want to produce fruit anymore. But if you want to live the spiritually formed life towards Jesus and actually follow him, you will be pruned. But the fruit that you produce, oh man, that is what's going to change the people around you. That is going to make people ask, what is different about you? That is what it looks like to be with Jesus. See, it's a process of pruning. Now, let me just say this to you. If you are a follower of Jesus in this room, this is what you should expect. You should not be upset that Jesus wants to make you more like him, and it's going to be a little painful. Church, we have to come back and have to understand what Jesus expects of the life that he wants us to live with him. Now look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Jesus is just dropping bombs in all of this. And I, I know you just heard what I said, but like, I want you to now picture your life. Close your eyes for a second. Picture the horrible things you've done. Keep them closed, and then listen to this one more time. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Because you've surrendered your life in me, you're already clean. And then give me a response to that. Come on. Good, right? So we work, and we work, and we don't believe that. Because somebody has convinced us that that's the lie. <laughs> I told my community on Thursday night that I was reading a, a devotional that I read in the morning and at night, and it said that a lot of times we get frustrated with God because the way that he has grown us to a point to hear him, we've paused. He has moved on and is trying to speak to us in different ways, and we're still listening for the old ways because he's trying to grow us and prune us and make us more like him, and he's moving us into new ways, and we're like, God, where are you? And this is where I think we get stuck. We don't believe that we're already cleaned by him. See, all of these things that he's putting together with the Holy Spirit and that he's going to, he said, I give you my peace. You're already clean. Just stay connected with me. I will prune you and make me, you more like me. We look at all of those things negatively. And Jesus is like, no, 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 this isn't negatively. Keep reading. Look at verse 4. He says, remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Jesus. <laughs> but it's true. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Now remember I asked you that question? You ready for the verse? If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. Is that not crazy? If you remain in him and his words remain in you, ask him whatever you want and he'll give it to you. Now, I, I, if anybody has just tuned in, please go back and watch the rest of this sermon. That is not to be pulled out just in that line. 
We have to understand what he's saying. If my thoughts, my, the images I see, my words and my actions are aligned with him, when I ask him to do something, he's going to do it because we are on the same page. See how that works? We're abiding in him. We're aware of the peace he's giving us. We're becoming more like him. And then he answers our prayers because of that. God, the situation at work, I know you have me here for a reason. You know this is really hard. Will you please answer this? I want them to see you. What is he going to say? No? <laughs> yes, I will. God, I, I'm here and I'm asking you for this. My heart is aligned with you. I'm becoming like you. The Holy Spirit is strong inside of me. You've pruned me. I'm like you. Will you do this? Now, here's what you need to realize. Jesus answers one of three ways. Yes, no, and not right now. So if he tells you no, you're okay with the answer because your heart is aligned with him and he knows better for you. So don't think this is just a yes machine like Jim Carrey, yes. <laughs> I want you to understand that your heart, though, will be aligned. And when he says no, you'll say, you know, you know what's best. So this word ab abiding literally means to remain, not to depart, and to stay home. For all of you homebodies, you just got excited. It's not what I mean, though. <laughs> it means to remain, to not depart, and to stay home. This is something I think is a whole life struggle for us. It's always interesting to me when we are learning to do something new, we're really intentional on doing everything the right way, and then we get comfortable, so we cut a few corners. We're so confident even that we'll order some Ikea furniture, not use the instructions, have 17 pieces left over, and still be proud of ourselves. <laughs> because when we do something, we follow it to the law when we're learning it, don't we? And then we're like, yeah, I can cut that out. I can do that. I can cut this. It's our human nature. Jesus is like, nope. Stick here. This is what you do the rest of your life. There are no shortcuts. Don't try to make any. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. So let me make something very clear about these practices, okay? Now, I'm going to give you the answer to this. Everybody say no on these next four questions I ask, okay? We're introducing these practices to you, but all of these practices are a means to an end. What is the end? The end is to be with Jesus, right? So is the point of reading the Bible to read the Bible? No, no it's to be with Jesus. Is the point of knowing your Bible to know the Bible? No, it's to be with Jesus. Is the point of prayer to pray? No, it's to be with Jesus. Is the point of fasting to fast? No, it's to be with Jesus. Don't get caught up in what we're going to do as the means in which you're going to accomplish this. They're just a means to an end. The end is to be with Jesus. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, this is where we're close. You have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Seems simple enough, but are we willing to remain with Jesus in order to get it? A lot of times we want the life, we don't want the lifestyle. Think of something that you want to be like. Maybe you want to be a pro athlete, maybe you still do. But then you see behind the curtains of what it's going to take and you don't want the lifestyle. Maybe a pro singer, an actor, an actress, a politician, a Navy SEAL, somebody who makes a lot of money, whatever it is for you. And then you realize what these people had to do to actually achieve those goals. And we want the life, but a lot of times we don't want the lifestyle. A lot of us, we want an intimate relationship with Jesus, but we don't want the lifestyle that comes along with it. Your life gives you the fruit based on how you live. Your life is designed to give you exactly the results of how you're living now. So I'm going to give you a peek inside of what Jesus' life was. He was unhurried, first and foremost. You know, in the Bible, when his friend Lazarus died, he stayed two more days before he ever even went because he was doing something. I mean, I think it was something important. He wasn't like rearranging speaker wires or anything. <laughs> But as he's met, as he comes into the town, they go, how dare you? If you would have got here sooner, he probably would be okay. But he died, right? <laughs> yes, he died. Okay, well, he's not dead. I'll get him back up. 
we can't do that, but that was awesome. <clears throat> he spent a lot of time in community. He spent a lot of time alone, and in a good, healthy alone. He Sabbathed every week. He lived very simply in church. He was at peace. In contrast, we are over busy. We are always on our phone. Digital addiction is a real problem. We're buying more than we need and most of the times more than we can afford. So we're always stressed out about money. The average smartphone user touches their screen 2,617 times a day. This is average. Over 83 sessions for a total of 300 plus minutes per day or five hours a day on our phones. But total screen usage on average in America is seven plus hours a day. Congratulations, Indy. We made the top five list of smartphone users. Yeah. Heavy usage is nearly twice that. No wonder why we don't have peace. When we swipe our phones 2,617 times a day, that is not going to create peace in us. So the question becomes, how do I be with Jesus with an iPhone <laughs> or a smartphone if you're one of those other people? <laughs> I have to answer this question too, church. We're on this journey together and it's difficult. But I can tell you it's going to require a rearrangement of your life. The goal of today is to be with Jesus. Very simply, I'm going to ask you to start the first 10 minutes of your day just being with Jesus. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what your morning routine is like, but let me tell you how it works for me. I have to get out of my house. Otherwise, there's way too many things to do. So I will go out and walk my neighborhood and pray. I try to go to areas where there aren't many people, so people don't think I'm a crazy person talking out loud to myself. <laughs> but that works for me. I don't know what it is for you. But what I'm going to ask you is you have to start somewhere if you, if you want to do this, if you want to be this. In your morning commute on the way, honestly, I'm going to say that doesn't count. Because you are far too distracted driving on our roads to spend actual alone time with Jesus. Back up before that. Find a place in your house, outside of your house, go sit in your car and then go back in and get ready. Whatever it looks, I don't know. But 10 minutes alone, unhurried with Jesus is going to be a really good start for you. Now, if you knock this off until next Sunday and you have 70 alone minutes with Jesus up until next Sunday, I want you to imagine how differently you'll be next Sunday. Now, if you blow it, and you combine seven minutes over the week, you had seven alone minutes with Jesus. Your life will be different, I promise you. Start somewhere. Let's close our eyes. God, we love you. We want to be with you. We understand that you lived a life totally different than ours. We can make all kinds of excuses that you didn't have a smartphone, uh, you know, you didn't have a laptop, you didn't have Netflix, whatever it is, but you had plenty of distractions you could have given into. God, these things aren't even bad. They're good things. They can be used for good things. But when they become who we are, it's going to stand in contrast to what you expect of us. And, and it's going to be in contrast to living a life that you would live if you were here. So I pray that we would gain proper perspective. That as we're striving to be with you, Jesus, if we're really going to practice the way of you in our city, let us just start somewhere today. First, let us just acknowledge we need some rearranging in our lives. I think we can all agree with that, myself included. Although I, I diligently work at this, I still need to be very intentional about some things I'm doing that I'm not doing right now. So I pray that our first thing, God, is we would just acknowledge this right now. Yes, I, I need to rearrange some things in my life. The second thing is, Lord, that we would 
be intentional about this like 10 minutes alone with you. It's not, it's not the time. It's, it's just a good marker to start at. Let us leave our phone in another room. Let us not turn on any electronics. Let us just sit with you, not even open our Bible at that time. Just sit with you. Talk to you or maybe even just listen. It can change each day. But God, as we start to introduce these practices, let, them, let us understand these are a means to an end, but let us start somewhere. God, I pray for my friends here today in the building, watching online, that this would excite them. That although you left us, you gave us the helper of the Holy Spirit, you've given us your peace, you've promised he would be with us all the time. God, we should be encouraged by that to know that we're forgiven if we're following you. God, as we sing one last song and as we pray and we leave this place today, I pray that our goal would be to be with you, Jesus. We love you and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Would you guys go ahead and up and stand?